The Women's National League kicks off this weekend and I'm delighted to say Karen Duggan of P-Mount is with us to help us preview the season and talk a little bit about the general state of the game at the moment. Karen, how are you getting on? I'm good, thanks. How are you? The uh, pre-season nerves, have they kicked in just yet or will that be like 10 minutes before kick-off tomorrow? Yeah, I'd say it's more of a 10-minute thing. Pre-season is always a bit of a slog, so you're nearly looking forward to the season kicking off. The actual games itself are a bit of a relief. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, well, to be fair, we've been lucky. We've played a good few games in pre-season, but we're playing against people we're going to be playing in the league because obviously because of the situation, um, we're the only teams that are really allowed to play because we've been given the elite status. So that's been good in one way, but it's been a bit weird in another. Um, so it's kind of felt like we started the league already because we're, we're getting familiar with each other early doors. Tell us, where do you think the main threat's going to come from uh, p Man's perspective this year? Because you guys are a little bit like the Harlem Globetrotters when it comes to the league over the last couple of years. And certainly speaking to some of your rivals, uh, they definitely feel like you guys are the ones that um, they need to catch. Yeah, well, that's always going to come when you've had back-to-back league successes. But if you look at kind of the history of the Women's National League, no one has managed to do the three in a row. Um, Wexford had a massive period of dom- dominance when they did four out of five years, but Shelburne um, pipped them for that third title in a row. So uh, we're under no illusion that it's going to be by any means easy. We know that there's a bit of a target on our back, but um, we're preparing as best we can. Um it's going to be hard to maintain the standards that we reached last year. I thought last year we had a really, really incredible season and this season has rolled around pretty quickly, but we're going to apply ourselves the way we did the last couple of seasons and hopefully we'll be able to fend off the challenge. But we can see that certain teams have strengthened massively and um, the likes of Shelburne getting Chloe Mustaki back and um, Saoirse Noonan up there now. That's been well documented. And Wexford, we all know how, how good and how strong they are. They kind of see it as their cup, so they'll be going on for us first game of the season now tomorrow. Yeah, I mean, that uh, we actually have been talking to Wexford Youth and, and they kind of have obviously been saying that you have been a very impressive squad over the last couple of years but that ultimately you know they they judge themselves on trophies and success and so therefore hopefully it's going to be a proper rivalry this year We always find that that Wexford away trip has been the one that's tripped us up in the past so we'll be hoping to put that right first game of the season and um, they'll be going in for us it's, it's funny that you get rivalries that aren't really local local rivalries there's always us in Shelburne but I think um, Wexford and it's just the teams who have been around the top and the pe- we've gotten to know each other so well over the years that we have formed these rivalries and it's making us improve each other and that's only a good thing for the league Karen you've, you've been with P-Mount on and off for the best part of a decade at this stage why have P-Mount been so successful over that period of time what what has because well, I you know it's obviously not anywhere like the same team as it was when you joined essentially as a kid. What is it about the club that draws good quality players, good quality coaching? And and why do you guys think that you're able to regenerate the way you have been able to? Yeah, we're very blessed. Um, I think my time away from Piedmont really taught me the value that the club has to offer. Um, it's a real community and I know that might sound a bit cliche, but you know all the, the people in the club, Dennis, Elaine, Katie, Barbara, like these are all names that you know, you can list them off by heart. They're like part of your family. And uh, it does sound cliche, but it is kind of like a community there. Um, when the Women's National League, you do have girls um, coming from all around the country into one squad, but it gives you that kind of community feel and everyone's kind of pulling for each other and pulling um, in the same direction from underage all the way up. Um, everyone's willing to, to give back to the underage team. Similarly, the underage teams have been feeding into the senior team and they've been producing some really, really good quali- quality talent. Um, every couple of years, there's two or three that come through and they're absolute superstars in the making. So we have that again this year. Um, we'll be looking at the likes of Della Doherty and Be- Becky Watkins to step up for us and they've come up from underage. Um, Neve Farley, who we unfortunately lost this year to Glasgow City on a professional contract. She came up through the ranks. So there's strong underage structure and that's kind of supported just by that sense of community that you do get with P-Mount United. And we're kind of blessed in that way in that we're not a standalone club um, with just a senior team. We do have that kind of uh, structure all the way up from underage. And I think that has been helpful in developing talent, but also in garnering that um, sense of, of community. Tell me a little bit about um, that whole relationship that the league has now with the national team and with the professional sides across the water. Because obviously there's a, there's there's a new ecosystem in, in women's football over the last decade or so, and, and particularly in the last two or three years where the game in England has started to explode. We see the massive uh, sluicing of, of money going through the system. 
in the last week with the TV deal, there's an opportunity for Ireland to make sure that we kind of limp it on to them. But there's also a possibility that we end up getting a little bit squashed the way the, the men's leagues have been. So what, what do you, as, as somebody who's been involved in the game the way you have been over the last decade, what do you want to happen and what do you think is going to happen? I think we we can't be um, under any illusion that we're going to become a professional league um, and we have to accept the fact that we are a feeder league but instead of girls having to leave straight away and go to places that are semi-professional I'd like for us to have that structure in Ireland so that yes we'll still feed into professional teams ultimately um, but at the start when people are learning their craft and learning their trade that they can do that in Ireland um, they can build up their skill set in this country help develop the league um, and in that way you'll continue that kind of revolving belt of talent if, if you can retain them um, for a good period of time if we have everyone going from under 17 and going straight up abroad we're not ever really going to develop the talent within the league and um, we're lucky at the moment that there is still really good experience within the league and um, they're helping the young ones through but we don't want them to to leave too quickly um, because that can have a detrimental effect on them as well if they decide to leave too early and they come disillusioned you know you see it often in the men's game where um, people don't finish school and they go over and they come back and then it's hard for them to kind of pick up where they left off but if we can have better structures in place that allows girls to stay in the country a little bit longer and prepare them for that full professional life I think that's something that we should be striving towards. Okay and and um, I, I, I know it's kind of a, a slightly different scenario too in that there's a lot of I don't know if this still happens, but certainly a decade ago, the US collegiate system was scouting a lot in Ireland. And so a lot of our best young internationals uh, underage would have gone off to America. And I remember the FAA were a bit ambivalent about this. It was like, well, you know, we develop these players and then they disappear for a while. I always kind of thought that it was the right thing to do because ideally they'll come back at some point or they go off and have an amazing life experience through football, which is kind of what is every kid's dream. So what what's that situation like now? And, and, and do we have a... a a mature relationship with that system? I'd be on the same page as you. I think that they have a chance to go abroad and play at a really, really high standard while also getting their education. And if we look at the talent that has gone through that system recently, there's some of our top, top players. You've got Megan Campbell, she went, Megan Connolly. I thought our top performer on the national team, the person who really stepped up throughout the Euro campaign was Heather Payne. And she's in Florida State at the moment. And her development from, she obviously saw her at Pima and she was, absolutely fantastic player but now I see her as going all the way to be in world class um, so I think it would be insane of us to not um, encourage that if you are going to be going to a college if the girls are going to be going to a college that are at that elite level and they're going to be acting almost as professionals but while getting this amazing life experience and their education I think that it should be that's probably a a really, really good route that should be encouraged rather than maybe girls going straight to somewhere in Europe where um, they're not getting that life experience and it's a foreign language and it's just a little bit more difficult to settle in. Anyone who I know who has gone to America on scholarship um, has really, really enjoyed their life experience um, and that can't be, you can't take away from that either, like that's that's something that's important and the happier you are, the better you're going to play and stuff, so I'd, I'd be a big fan of that route, obviously it's harder in terms of travel and stuff and getting girls back, but if you develop in the way that we've seen Heather Payne develop, I think that it, it's definitely a good thing. And I think, you know, if you're trying to market the sport to teenagers who are good at sports, you can say that this is a potential for you down the line, which is something that obviously you can't really say with... I mean, obviously Gaelic football now has the possibility for people going to Australia and spending some time out there as well, which is... Uh, these are things, and, and rugby has that professional element too. You were a camogie player. You, you were a, a Kilkenny minor, is that right? I, I was... I tried to be a, a camogie player. Um, yeah, I played underage, um, under 16 and, and minor um, at the same time that I was playing soccer and I still play club camogie um, with my club in Pilltown in Kilkenny and I absolutely love it. It's kind of my first love, you know, when you grow up Kilkenny, you're kind of born with the, the hurley in your hand. So I was lucky that I was allowed the opportunity to play both sports um, growing up. I know often now people are encouraged to kind of... Um, focusing on one sport very early and maybe that's a good thing and maybe it's a, a bad thing I'm not sure what the the stats and stuff are on that but for me Camogie gave me some of the the best days of my life particularly we won an intermediate club Camogie with my um, club in Pilltown that was one of the most amazing days you're 
with all your local family and friends. It just has a different feeling. Um, but soccer gave me the opportunity, like you say, to kind of travel abroad and see new things. And it opened up an awful lot of opportunities that you wouldn't get through the GA. But I was lucky enough to experience both at that young age. So uh, I'm very grateful for that. It, it's a nice uh, different um, it's a cocktail of different sports that um, people can play, particularly if you reach a certain level of athleticism. And I think that's one of the the main things that all of the, the sports need to be cognizant of that you want as many people playing as many sports as long as possible until they find which the one that they want to dedicate their time to. Yeah, exactly, because you don't know what you're going to be best at. I excelled at soccer in the end, but I, the skills that I learned from playing um, basketball, playing camogie, they've definitely helped. I think my kind of style of play is kind of combative, kind of the way that you would be in a camogie match and kind of that grit and you learn by by uh, having 30 women on a pitch with sticks. So um, that's definitely helped me in my soccer career. Um, obviously, if you spend more time training at one sport, you might build up certain specific skills. But I think that there is um, cross functions to different trainings that would would really help you. And I think from a young age, it should be encouraged. And I think that that's a thing that managers of underage teams really need to take into consideration. Um, everyone, if you have an elite person, who, they tend to be good at a few sports and you can get pulled in all different directions, but you need to manage their load as well and things like that. So I think it should be encouraged. I think it should be allowed. And ultimately, you're going to pick the sport that you like the most or that you feel like you're going to get the most opportunities from. But that comes with time and it should be the, the choice of the individual in the end of the day. The other thing about this is is obviously the game isn't professional in, in Ireland at the moment. So you've got to maintain a career. It is that kind of amateur status that uh, in the GEA we laud. In, in football, you kind of want as much professionalism as, as you can possibly do. How well do we in Ireland do at allowing players to play at the elite level in the club game here or play internationally as you've done and also at the same time make room for careers and how how do we do in Ireland when it comes to uh, allowing people women who are who are career women to play sport at an elite level I think this is an interesting one and it's becoming um, more prevalent in since um, maybe Colin Bell and stuff took over you'll see that the amount of professionals on the team far outnumber the number of girls who are in the Women's National League and are balancing uh, work or college as well. Whereas when I first started, um, it was probably the other way around or, or more 50-50. Um, I think obviously there's so many benefits to the girls going professional. They're all going to improve so much, but you don't want to see um, the other side of it neglected. There's so much talent in this country um, and some people need to stay for one reason or another um, and they shouldn't be cast aside or shouldn't not be considered because of that choice. Um, if you're good enough, it shouldn't matter that you're playing in Ireland and you're trying to balance a career. Um, maybe it's just not the right time for someone to go professional um, or maybe it, the standard in the Women's National League may well be as high as some of the professional leagues or the second division teams in Europe and things like that. So it's, it's becoming more difficult it seems from the outside, I'm not involved now, but I certainly started when I was in the national team and from the outside now, it seems like it is a little bit more difficult to break into that starting 11 on the national team in particular, if you're not professional. Um, and I can't say that, that whether that's because of talent or whether how the girls are training when they're in camp, but it does seem from the outside that it is becoming a little bit more difficult and that professional route is obviously a better one to develop talent but you would like to see it maybe go through the collegiate American route first I think um, just to prepare people for life after sport Well that's the thing isn't it it's not like these are um, earning Premier League wages and so therefore you can retire at 30 and flute around and spend the 15 to 20 million quid that you've banked you know check your investments on, on your uh, Revolut account you can't do that like you, you do absolutely have to prepare for life after sport yeah, certainly not the case. And um, there's good scholarship programs that you can look into, but also certain people develop at a, at a different stages. Like I was probably a bit of a late bloomer. I didn't get my first start until I was 23 or 24. Like I'd already been through college. I was working. Um, and then I really started to apply myself probably a little bit better and stuff. But I, I don't think I would have done well moving away um, at an early age I was pretty shy pretty quiet and I think it would have been difficult for me to settle so I think you have to understand 
a person's personality as well. Um, it's not enough to just be a coach. Now you have to know how to manage your players as as individuals. And if someone's better off in Ireland, where you should have more access, you could possibly help them more with training. Um, then that should be encouraged and that should be allowed as well. It shouldn't be looked down on. And I hope that that's the case. I hope that um, the management team now, hopefully when COVID is over, that there's a bit more structure to the home-based training, that it's more frequent, um, that girls in this country are afforded the same opportunities as girls who are professional, that it's not just done on reputation, that it's done on form. And if the professionals are better because they're training more, that's fair enough. But if the girls at home are willing to put in similar amount of training and they do have that talent then it should be an equal playing field I think and it'd be it seems that from the outside it would be foolish to cut off that talent pool actually the right thing to do is to encourage as many people to get up to the level of the professionals as possible and to broaden that net and and that in turn will hopefully feed the competition for places in the national team yeah and uh, there would be no shame if someone went abroad and came back and like played in the women's national league and then went again so it just because you've gone professional and maybe if it's not working out there's no shame in coming back to Ireland maybe getting another year where you're playing week in week out and then maybe trying professional again I think that we see men coming back from and coming into the the League of Ireland a lot of guys come back on loan and then go back to their parent clubs and I really think that um the Women's National League is is a really good standard now and it is developing. I think you'll see this season in particular, there's going to be a lot of club step up to the mark that we weren't um, aware would be as good. We've played Athlone and Bowes and DLR in pre-season. I've been really, really impressed with their progression and I think there's going to be some shock results this year. So there's opportunity. If, when girls are playing week in, week out and there's competition for places and you've got that opportunity to play 90 minutes, um, that brings about a lot of confidence and some girls will be confidence players. So if it means coming into the Women's National League or staying in the Women's National League in Ireland for an extra couple of years until you're ready to take that step to professionalism, um, then I think that that should be encouraged as well. Again, it comes back to your man and management and just knowing your players and knowing what's best for your players. So we're here having this conversation on the radio on a Friday night. Is your voice and and the voice of your teammates and your peers is that being fed into is it being listened to is it being solicited when it comes to what the future of the league looks like and and what the relationship between the women's national team and the women's national league and the players who are playing internationally like it just seems to me like you've got a lot of experience here and um the ability to articulate that right now at this moment in the history of the league as we enter this transformational period where finally there's coverage of every game available digitally there will be some increased interest from sponsors the FAI absolutely have to follow through on the promises they've made we're nearly there when it comes to paying the same to our international players like it seems like a transformational moment but your voice and the voices of your peers needs to be amplified and heard and listened to yeah they do and um, I think they are certain to be heard um, we've the sponsorship deal this year has has made a huge difference. It's taken a, a bit of the pressure off the fundraising aspect, and obviously that's not something you want to be thinking about going into a season. But those little things are all they seem like they're small things, but they're massive strides for us. Um, and it, there's a promise that they're going to get more home based training now for the girls who are in Ireland in the women's national league who want to break into the national team. So if these things are followed through they're going to make a massive massive difference and there's a lot of voices within the league there's a lot of girls who've been there since inception like myself who have a lot to say and um i think that their voices hopefully are starting to be heard um but we're going to keep banging on the door anyway um even after retirement age i think that so many of us have invested so much time in the women's national league that we want to see it continue to grow because we know that the value it's going to have um in the overall structure of women's football in this country and the national team and they're still waiting to make that final breakthrough into a major tournament and I think that it's really important that we don't neglect the importance of the women's national league and the role that that's going to play in feeding into the national team so that they can make that breakthrough. That bit's really interesting the bit where you said that even when you retire you're going to keep banging on the door because I know a lot of people who've been involved in the League of Ireland as players they actually they end up just sickened by 
the neglect that the league has suffered over such a long period of time and banging their head against a brick wall that they end up not getting involved in clubs and not going to those boring meetings that you have to put your hand up in and put yourself forward for to get on some committee where ultimately you can be one of the ones making the decision in the end and that's the transformative moment for Irish football when your generation who have already made a stand for the women's national team and have seen the power of that get involved at an administrative level and it's really boring and it's like it's a drain on your time and resources but if you guys don't do it nobody will well that's it and I think that getting to learn that um, because of our experience in 2017 and seeing the value that the PFAI brought to us um, in that moment seeing we needed representation at that time Um, that was the thing we had obviously been harping on and harping on to try and get better conditions for the national team but it was we weren't in a position we weren't experienced enough in those kind of negotiation scenarios to to really make an impact um but now some of us have that experience and if it's going to take um more representation for us to progress the league we are now in the position to we're not as good as the pfai but we could certainly lend some advice we can be representatives um, of the league and of that generation that have learned from things that have gone on in the past and I think the likes of Anya O'Gorman, she's really spearheaded things um, from early doors well before that 2017 stance and she's continuing to do so um, within the league she's a real driver and I know that there's other representatives from other teams there's captains committees now um, that are getting involved and and that's really really positive and it's all going on in the background and you don't see the work that these girls are doing but I would like to just um, give a big shout out to them now because the captains have been working tirelessly in the background and other representatives and I think like you said hopefully um, these won't be falling on deaf ears and we're going to continue to progress the league because I can already see the talent is progressing this year Um, some people might say it dipped in and out but I think that this year you're really going to see um, a really competitive league and um, we're going to need the backing of, of the higher powers to, to continue in that vein. The, the best part about it is that they absolutely need you. The, the FAI needs the women. They, they need a strong women's league. They need a strong women's national team and they need strong performance numbers, uh, participation numbers in the underage as well because like it, it's a clearly obvious thing to do. The government are finally waking up to the, the notion that they're going to, well, why are we giving funding just to the lads? This doesn't make any sense. And the country needs women playing sport and attending matches and like it's kind of this easy win-win but they just have to uh, start listening I think Yeah, like you say even the fact that the, the matches are now going to be streamed, we saw that starting last year but it was it was on the clubs to take that on themselves and to get those infrastructures in place but even now having the watch LOI streaming service it's it's not just going to be helpful for COVID it's it's helpful because it's going to provide more exposure more people are going to watch um, and more people then are going to start growing into the game and that's going to be a huge thing so it is all these little wins that are going to make a big difference and everything you're saying there is absolutely bang on um, and yeah all we can do is, is hope that it continues Well listen best of luck with the rest of the season or the start of the season and we'll talk to you again real soon Thanks a million Thank Karen Thank you so much Thank you